The um, uh, rosy lips, and sh- the love's not time's full, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come, is uh, CXV1. So that's uh, what? 106? No. 116? 116. So, onward. Forward. Uh, there are a few songs of Shakespeare that you might not know that have a funny kind of uh, uh, literality. Uh, what they're good for is a uh, to see that uh, the crazy uh, crazy Shakespeare or uh, funny Shakespeare was funny precisely because of his totally accurate observation the, the almost William Carlos Williams like kitchen sink uh, mindfulness uh, uh, specifically in a little song from Love's Labor's Lost when icicles hang by the wall and Dick the shepherd blows his nail because it's cold. Uh, and for years when I was in grammar school, I thought Blows' Nail was some kind of a horn or something. <laughs> Just that, like the old thing coming and blowing his nail. Which is like a real observation of winter. So all these images of winter. When icicles hang by the wall, and Dick the shepherd blows his nail, and Tom bears logs into the hall, and milk comes frozen home in pail, when blood is nipped and ways be foul, then nightly sings the staring owl to wit, to woo, a merry note, while greasy Joan doth kill the pot. Uh, to wit, to woo, to woo is obviously a pun, like nothing to do with what make love in the midwinter night. It's owl, Alan. To wit, to woo is owl. owl. Yes, of course. But what does the owl say? Make love. <laughs> to wit, to woo. Yeah. Carlos, did you read Shakespeare? Right there, yes. <laughs> so Carlos uses to wit, to woo also. He's imitating Shakespeare, probably. Nightly sings the staring every night when everybody finally has come in and, and the pot's been uh, keeled. What does keel the pot mean? Anybody know? Greasy Joan does. I know what Greasy Joan. <laughs> so what's Greasy Joan? What does keel the pot mean? Stir Clean it or stir it? Scrape it? Is there a note back here? No. No. So all we'll have to accept. Stir oh, it. Back in my class. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> to wit, to woo. <laughs> well, I always interpret that meaning to wit. That is to say, to wit means to wit. What is what is the what is the uh, what is the owl saying? To wit, to it's woo. Of course, it's on a monopig. But what's better than it's on a monopig is it also makes a funny little pun sense. That's how ancient Egyptian got man. They did all on a monopig. It was all phonetic. You know what it means. When they do a picture of an owl, it doesn't go to it to woo. It's what it sounds like. It's not the picture of the owl. The picture of the sound. Owl. What's the picture of the sound of the owl in the Egyptian? All right. Owl means... Now, here you go. Top shot. Owl means power stick. Owl? Owl. A-W-L. Power stick. O-W-L. Power stick. You know what it looks like? Mm-hmm. You want to board? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the old, why was the owl in ancient Greece used as wisdom? Don't know. All right. They used Minerva's it on their money, Minerva's the drachma. Bird. They used it on the drachma to know. Here's the owl. I'll get the owl. Minerva's <laughs> bird. Get rid of Saraswati and Nietzsche. Nietzsche, you gave them Nietzsche, that's nice. No, stuff. somebody else did, somebody else Nietzsche. That's the owl. Is that the Egyptian <laughs> herd of the power? That's the Egyptian glyph of owl. Perfect. All right, now the power stick looks like this. That's always with the arm. For their furniture, they do the, let's say a chair, they do the power stick and the arm together. <coughs> and it makes a nice design for furniture. <laughs> <laughs> now the owl gets sometimes this. 
What's that? That's a pair of feet walking. I mean, let's say you get a cock. They draw a cock. They're on the cock walking. To wit to woo. You got it. Hallelujah. <laughs> when all allowed the wind doth blow, <laughs> and coughing, and coughing drowns the parson's saw. The parson babbling in church, talking like a uh, don't get too drunk and don't uh, don't uh, listen to any mad poets and uh, <laughs> and coughing drowns the parson's saw, and birds sit brooding in the snow. That was Shakespeare's. Oh, that was Shakespeare's favorite line. That was Kerouac's favorite line. Birds sit brooding. No, Kerouac's best was with Shakespeare was this: fat as butter, cheap as an egg. Oh yeah, where was that from? Shakespeare. I mean, where? Paul Ah, fat as butter, cheap as an egg. Henry yeah. Sank. What year was that? Henri Sank. What year? Sank? No, I mean, no, uh, Kerouac. Leave me alone. Like <laughs> <laughs> well, I got a lot of my, I got my Shakespeare originally from Burroughs. The first, the first Shakespeare I ever understood was out of Burroughs's mouth. Um, uh, 1944 Christmas, I went down from Columbia University to Greenwich Village for the first time in my life taken by a, a degenerate fellow student whom I was in love with, and in, who was from St. Louis and who knew Burroughs. And um, they were describing a drunken and bloody night that had taken last Saturday in a dyke bar where this kid had gotten into like a totally alcoholic fight and bitten off some bull dyke's earlobe. <laughs> it was like such a disgusting story. Well, not disgusting, but I, knew, I mean, I, knew, I came from Patterson, New Jersey, and I never knew about people like that. Much less getting drunk and fighting on the floor of a bar and biting somebody's ear till it was bleeding. And Burroughs said, "'Tis too starved an argument for my sword." <laughs> you know, he said, "As the immortal bard, as the immortal bard said, 'Tis too starved an argument for my sword.'" That led to another line I heard him once quote, which is similar. I mean, it's actually a very, again, a very uh, a de detachment, a line of detachment, a very Buddhist line. It's too starved an argument for my sword. A starved argument is a very funny idea, I guess. There's another line uh, in, in The Tempest, uh, when, the, when the fools are scared by the music. I think Tempest. And uh, maybe Caliban or Ariel says, put up your sword. Or, no, it's Romeo and Juliet. Put up your swords, lest the bright dew rust them. Ah, oh, we met a dyke bar. <laughs> <laughs> a different dyke bar. It's a different well, dyke bar. Actually, I lived on 9th Street and 6th Day Avenue, and I watched this chick taking his shit all the time, pissing him back, and fucking. I'm trying to keep it on Shakespeare. <laughs> I'm trying to keep it on Shakespeare. You gotta relate it to Shakespeare. Uh, wait, I met you in a police station. Yeah. And you've got my poesy. <laughs> oh, he was Shakespearean. Poetry. That's right. Alright, you've got my poesy, right? And I told you, well, I'd like you to take me to introduce me to this girl who I don't know. <laughs> she fucks these people so good when I jerk off to it. She's 20 years old, right? And he said, well, gratefully, I'm the man who fucks her. <laughs> you knew the address. Right, it's funny, right, 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 uh, what was her name? Dusty. Dusty. <laughs> Dusty Moreland from Wyoming. And, and you watch me fuck her. Yeah. <laughs> we, were all, we were all in bed together, actually. We wound up all in bed together. Which is a basic poetic situation. <laughs> But then you have that consequence of it later on, 20 years later, so you've got to put up with each other. <laughs> <laughs> That's the actual karma of, you know, of that, uh, that kind of like a total uh, uh, devotion. And, and it's an old poetic problem. Like, what do you do with Christopher Marlowe who insists on going into the bar and getting, getting his eye pricked out and getting killed in his drunken brawl? What do you do with uh, um, Shakespeare tongue-inspired Kerouac? Uh, who drink a hole in their stomach. Yeah. What do you do with Chogyam Trungpa <laughs> and his sake? What do you do with Gregory in his uh, round of 24,000 years? All right. <laughs> Don't get me kitten all over, man. 
Spine, right? Well, again, Kit Marlowe, yeah, uh, Jack Kerouac, and uh, Trunkbuck. What do you take your choice? Well, I don't think Trunkbuck's fucked up yet because he's alive. But yeah. Trunkbuck's fucked up and Marlowe because they're dead. <laughs> <laughs> the dead are all fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> when all aloud the wind doth blow, and coughing drowns the parson's saw, and birds sit brooding in the snow, and Marion's nose looks red and raw, when roasted crabs hiss in the bowl, then nightly sings the staring owl to wit, to woo, a merry note, while greasy Joan doth kill the Pope. Kerouac always kept asking, who is Greasy Joan? <laughs> I want to meet Greasy Joan. <laughs> I want to fuck Greasy Joan. <laughs> it's just those two, two words like conjured up this person. Like is it, in two words, like a complete specter is there, like <laughs> with her job, you know, kneeling at the pot, greasy. <laughs> no wonder greasy, because she has to clean out the pot, so she's got all this grease up to her elbow. But everything absolutely, it, like William Carlos Williams' imagism, icicles are hanging by the wall, the shepherd's blowing his nail, somebody's bringing logs into the hall, named Tom, milk is frozen in the pail, blood's nipped, and that's a little far out. Yeah, that's the most top class poem, To whit, to woo, the actual sound of the owl. Greasy Joan working there, <laughs> wind blowing, coughing while the parson is saying, like, everything's all right, folks, you know, keep, keep, it, keep it low. Birds sitting brooding in the snow, Marion's nose, red and raw. Crabs hiss in the bowl. To whit, to woo, the owl again. Joan back there still at the pot. What's so great about that is the accuracy, I mean, like the, the focus, the concentration of uh, attention, like a Zen or haiku, every line worthy of haiku, every line a, a fact, uh, every line a sensory detail. It's a, a song from Love's Labor's Lost. I mean, the whole play is as good as that. This is just sort of concentrated into one song. Uh, you know the little song from The Tempest, Full Fathom Five? Uh, who, how many here do not know Full Fathom Five, That Father Lies? Well, amazingly great. <laughs> well, that's, this is actually, this is among us, this is considered by a lot of people, or was considered 20 years ago, by a lot of people, to be the most beautiful little piece of poem in the whole English language. Uh, now, the situation in The Tempest, I think uh, um, uh, Prospero, the, who I was talking, the magician, had made up a tempest and had entrapped all his old karmic enemies and brought them to his magic isle and separated them so they were confused. And Ferdinand, a young, sweet-looking prince, was going to marry Prospero's daughter at the end of the play, Miranda, is separated from his father, uh, whose name I've forgotten, and uh, thinks his father is dead. And I think Ariel sings him a song. It's probably sung by Ariel Imagination. Do you know? Full fathom five thy father lies. Of his bones are coral made. Those are pearls that were his eyes. Nothing of him that doth fade, but doth suffer a sea change into something rich and strange. Sea nymphs hourly ring his knell. Ding dong, hark, I hear them now. Ding dong, bell. I don't know how she would, I think it would be a song, so I don't know how they would say ding dong, bell at the end. I never figured that part out. Shelly has that on his grave out. Sea nymphs hourly, no, uh, these are pearls that were his eyes or what? Right. That, that line? Or, uh, you know, Nothing of him that does fade. What does suffer a sea change into something rich and strange? Shelley has it on his tomb. Okay, I'll read it once again for those who've never heard it before. In fact, three times. Three times, that's the official number for a mantra. Full fathom, F-A-D-O-M, or fathom. Full five fathoms down into the ocean. Because the kid thought his father was 
drowned in the ocean with a tempest. Four fathom five thy father lies, comma, of his bones are coral made. Those are pearls that were his eyes. Nothing of him that doth fade, but doth suffer a sea change into something rich and strange. Sea nymphs hourly ring his knell. Then from Wastage, Burden, Ding Dong. Hark, I hear them now. Ding Dong Bell. I don't know what, I don't know how Ariel sings. Uh, she probably sings Ding Dong Bell, so probably like a. Ariel was a, a, probably played by a 15 year old adolescent boy as like a fairy, like an airy fairy running through the air. Pardon me? Purcell, Purcell wrote music. Yeah, do you, have you ever heard it? I've heard, I, I know one little second, that's all. Of what? Come, come unto the yellow sand. Can you sing it? Yeah. Sing, sing away. Come unto the yellow sand and the sand. Come unto the yellow sand and the sand. Put it deep here and there, and let the rest all burden bear. Put it deep here and there, and let the rest all burden bear. Hark, hark, the watch doth fall, hark, hark, I hear the strains of Chanticleer. Hmm. I have the text. I read the text just as prose or po- as prose. Come unto these yellow sands, and then take hands, curtsied when you have, and kissed the wild waves. Whist, foot it featly here and there, and sweet sprites the burthen bear. And it says here, burthen dispersedly. What does that mean? Burthen is the refrain. Would burthen be a refrain? In the, in the song, it's- Put his feet here and there. That way you dance it, feet in there. But then. Bark, the, bark, the, the no, watchdog no, 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 barks. No, it's just a, a stage direction. Uh, and sweets writes the burthen bear. And then it says in italics, in, in, in parentheses, burthen dispersedly. Mm-hmm. Meaning the, diff- the, the different the actors. Setting hark, hark, bow wow, the watchdogs bark, bow wow. B O W G H, W A W G H for bow wow. <laughs> That's a good, solid. Spelling. <laughs> hark, hark, I hear the strain of strutting chanticleer cry cock a diddle dow. Yeah. That was first, first uh, he, was he contemporary of Shakespeare? No. So that wasn't yeah, then. He was just a cock a diddle dow. Uh-huh. Mae West with W.C. Fields had it when the chicken said, or the rooster said, cock a doodle doo. Mae West said to W.C. Fields, any cock a doodle. With hay, with hay, the thrush and the jay. <laughs> And uh, so William Carlos Williams said, for our day, what do we use for a musical refrain? You can't have a word, hey, with hey, the thrush and the jay, or cock a doodle doo. So he said to the, for it was a similar musical effect, he said in his short poem to the mailman, why don't you bring me a letter with some money in it? I could use some of that. Attaboy, attaboy. Uh, and he, he was thinking if we were going to replace with our own language, the archaic refrains or burden, burdens, the archaic burdens, we'd have to do it out of our own tongues, out of our own mouths, and find attaboy, attaboy, as the burden. Uh, <coughs> I don't know how that was. I think so. Uh, it would be sort of interesting to. S- he didn't set it to music, but it would be. Me? No. Uh, no, it'd be possible. But uh, as an as a amateur, Musician learning chords only in my 45th year uh, and only knowing three chords at a time, uh, uh, I fell into country western Bob Dylan style poetic lyric musics. And, uh, and uh, so, except for, say, att- attempting to adapt uh, that long breath, Om Saraswati Hri Soha, to I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness. <laughs> <laughs> no, I could do, I, I've adapted, I, I've improvised on the long line in hell. 
sort of in Hebraic style more. You know. uh, it's possible to do. But uh, Williams would, some of Williams would be possible because there's funny refrains, like Beautiful Thing. Uh, I think there's a poem, uh, Perpetual Mobile of the City, is that? Or, which has a refrain, Beautiful Thing. <coughs> so there are a few things, or a few very delicate little um, uh, free, free verse forms in Williams that he probably could sing and probably have been set. Well, I will get to that later. I mean, when we get to the, uh, uh, when we deal with modern open form poetry, I'll try and see what we can do with music, with that, improvising or however we can do it. But it's still such a pleasure to um, present um, of his bones are coral made, these are pearls that were his eyes to, to your half innocent ears that let's stick to the old rhymed verse. Uh, getting on to Shakespeare's friend Johnson for a moment. Funny, witty Johnson. Also writing for music. Uh, this has a this is a hymn, so literally for music. Uh, but here more stately than any of the uh, cherry ripe themselves do cry, sort of li uh, uh, pop pop songs. Right, like cherry ripe themselves do cry is like a really like 16th century pop style. Uh, Johnson is. Um, when? 1572, born, 1637. I'll read it with the, uh, uh, using, uh, stopping my breath, or taking a breath with his commas, uh, which is something I think I mentioned when I was reading the Shelley the other day, that in reading all older poetry, if you'll pay attention to the actual punctuation, if you can find the original punctuation, if you can find a text that has the original punctuation, uh, particularly in Blake, but especially in, in a very sensitive poets like Campion or Johnson, whose ears are perfect, and whose hand, therefore, was perfect in marking time, uh, if you pay attention to the commas, semicolons, or dashes, or the line lengths, you'll get some indication of how to breathe while vocalizing the poem. <clears throat> and uh, sometimes it's a very uh, delicate, like in this hymn, Queen, comma, and huntress, comma, chaste, comma, and fair, comma, now the sun is laid to sleep. So it's like a very funny music that's being set up. Queen, and huntress, chaste, and fair, no, I didn't do it right because I didn't breathe. Queen, and huntress, chaste, and fair, now the sun is laid to sleep, seated in thy silver chair, state in wanted manner keep, Hesperus entreats thy life, goddess, excellently bright. Earth, let not thy envious shade dare itself to interpose. Cynthia's shining orb was made heaven to clear when day did close. Bless us then with wished sight, goddess, excellently bright. Lay thy bow of pearl apart, and thy crystal shining quiver. Give unto the flying heart space to breathe, how short soever. Thou that makest a day of night, goddess, excellently bright. Well, whether you're not, you, you, well, I was just doing sound and time, so I wasn't even hardly following what it was all about, what the poem was about. Um, and I don't even know if I could figure it out. Queen and Huntress, who was a Queen and Huntress chaste and fair? That would be Diana, the moon, is that? So, moon. Queen and, huntre Queen and Huntress chaste and fair. Now the sun is laid to sleep. So it was an address to the moon. Now the sun is laid to sleep. Seated in thy silver, moony chair. State in wanted manner, keep. Hesperus entreats thy light. Hesperus, morning star. Hesperides, morning star, right? 
Is Hesperus the, uh, not the morning star? No. What is? Lucifer. Ah. Then what is Hesperus? In the, in the Bible has a we had this yesterday. Like we had this. Is well, okay, then Hesperus, the evening star, would not treat the light of the moon. Uh, now, wait a minute. <laughs> right on. Answer him back. But he is bullshit because it's the same. Evening star, morning star, both Venus. Yeah. Different names. Different right. Oh, they're the planet, huh? <laughs> They are both on the planet Venus. Right. Are you yeah, saying Venus. is that true? See Venus in the morning, they call it Lucifer. See Venus in the evening, they call it Lucifer. Lucifer. I see. So the so rising the Bible, of Venus. In the Bible, you don't find that Lucifer was kicked out of heaven, but they have in the Old Testament that Lucifer fell. Mm -hmm. The evening star fell. Which would be what? Lucifer. Meaning, mean Venus. morning or evening? Well, both. Maybe I told you. Maybe that is screaming that they're both the same. <laughs> Well, this, but Hesperus himself, Hesperus, however, is a specific name for the evening or the morning. Then, well, you're saying that uh, Lucifer, Lucifer would be morning and Hesperus evening. Now, wait a minute. Let's get the Hesperus. Uh, you, no, I would like to get this straight. Hesperus then would be evening and Lucifer morning. Lucifer evening. Which is which? Does anybody know? Lucifer fell. In other words, evening fell. Might be. Well, then why would Hesperus? Why would Hesperus? Then why would Hesperus entreat the light of the moon? Why would Hesperus entreat the moon to be lit up? I know I'm right that I've been so wrong. Okay. Oh, I know everything there is to know because there ain't that much to know. It's a great line, actually. Uh, does everybody remember that line? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Lucifer means light arrow, so it probably is the morning star. Uh huh. Okay. Well, Hesperus would make sense here. Hesperus, the evening star, entreating the light of the moon. Who's Hesperus? <laughs> okay. Right on. Who is Hesperus? Who knows Hesperus? Who knows Hesperus? Hesperus may be the name of something uh, known as the sun behind the sun. I think it has something to do with the sun. But I'm not. They say a Hyperion. Oh, that's Hyperion. I'll find out who Hesperus is by Friday. The truth is that most of the evening sun has fell. Well, we'll find that out too. Wake up. Wake up. <laughs> Earth, let not thy envious shade dare itself to interpose. <laughs> Cynthia's shining. Well, so they don't want the earth to get in the way there. Cynthia's shining orb was made heaven to clear when day did close. Bless us then with wished sight, goddess excellently bright. So all it's saying is, you know, it's like moon, come on and shine. But a hymn to the moon to shine. Lay thy bow of pearl apart in thy crystal shining quiver. Uh, Diana was also a huntress. Give unto the flying heart, H-A-R-T. The heart is a deer. Rabbit. Heart, rabbit or deer? Rabbit. Deer. 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 Okay. Let's take a vote. <laughs> Who wants it to be a rabbit? Who wants it to be a rabbit? Who wants it to be a deer? You're outvoted three to one. We'll find that out too. Give unto the flying heart space to breathe. How short soever. Thou that makes how short soever, how thou that makes a day of night, goddess excellently bright. Uh, but, uh, somebody must have set that to music and made it like a really solid anthem, like him of the, because it, it's so it's a, such a perfect setup that queen and huntress, chaste and fair. Now the sun is laid to sleep. It's just like a, it's a perfect uh, time and stately time. Epitaph on S.P. Salathiel Tavi, or Solomon Tavi, a child actor of Queen Elizabeth's chapel. Weep with me, all you that read this little story, and know 
for whom a tear you shed, death's self is sorry. T'was a child that so did thrive in grace and feature, as heaven and nature seemed to strive which owned the creature. Years he numbered scarce thirteen, when fate turned cruel. Yet three fills, yet three filled zodiacs had he been the stage's jewel, and did act what now we moan, old men so duly, as sooth the parkai fates taught him one, he played so truly. So, by error, to his fate they all consented. But viewing him since, alas, too late, they have repented, and have sought to give new birth in baths to steep him. But being so much too good for earth, heaven vows to keep him. It's just like witty and intelligent and uh, sympathetic and appreciative of like a 13-year-old actor who for three zodiacs, three years, had played old men uh, and died 13. Uh, I, like a small town, small scale. I don't know how many people lived in London then that would have gone to the theater, but it's like for uh, something that you, you would... Uh, where everybody would know who S.T. was, who Salathiel Pavi, or Solomon Pavi also, as he was called. Everybody would know who he was, and everybody would have seen him around the streets, or would have seen him on the stage. Uh, I don't know, I may have made a mistake there. I think maybe a heart might be a deer. <laughs> <laughs> I was just around it. So no, it might be a deer. Really yes, yeah, it's a deer. It's a deer. I've written. Well, I've written. Well, I, was it was a I, I wrote a line years ago about tame the heart and wear the bear. The heart is then what a young, a uh, young deer, but just a mature deer. Isn't it a deer? Wow, so embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> Song, Cecilia. So now we're in song. We're actually into an area where you where you're already where you are already familiar. Uh, we've brought the lyric up to a uh, place where you've heard it already, which is "Drink to me only with thine eyes, and I will pledge with mine." <laughs> or leave a kiss but in the cup and I'll not look for wine. The thirst that from the soul doth rise doth ask a drink divine. But might I of Jove's nectar sup, I would not change for thine. I sent thee late a rosy wreath, not so much honoring thee, as giving it a hope that there it could not wither it be. But thou thereon, thereon didst only breathe, and sent it back to me, since when it grows and smells I swear, not of itself, but thee. Because I wasn't following exactly the breathing, because I couldn't remember the exact tune. So that, survived, that tune survived, I guess that's an old tune, isn't it? Survives from Samuel Johnson's time, Shakespeare's time. <laughs> Next two. Uh, Johnson on Shakespeare. Has, has anybody ever? Uh, best, it's sort of literary and boring. I think I'll skip it. I think so. He made a mistake on America. You know, it's the time of the revolution. He said America sucked. Johnson said in that in that particular right, song. At that time, man. In that song. George was the king. Uh, in in that particular uh, <laughs> in that particular thing on Shakespeare. Not on Shakespeare, but just in history. Well, I like. I like Johnson's ear. I like Johnson's ear. That queen and huntress, chaste and fair, doesn't suck because it breathes. No, I'm not talking about that one. I'm oh. talking about what he said about America. Oh, I was talking about his memory of Shakespeare. When I first took your class, I put something up with Sam Johnson's on the wall. But I hate what? mankind. Oh, this, is Johnson. Johnson. This, this is Ben Johnson. This is Ben Johnson. 
you talking about? Sam Johnson. Sam Johnson. Oh, Ben is top class. Listen, we're reading Ben Johnson. <laughs> you idiot! We're reading Ben Johnson, the contemporary of Shakespeare. No wonder you didn't know that a heart was a deer. You thought a heart was a rabbit. You're undone. You're unmapped. Proving the fool that you are. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're up to John Fletcher and Francis Beaumont. <laughs> Song. Orpheus with his lute made trees, and the mountain tops that freeze bow themselves when he did sing. To his music, plants and flowers ever spring, as suns and showers, there had been a lasting spring. Everything that heard him play, even the billows of the sea, hung their heads and then lay by. In sweet music is such art, kill, no, in sweet music is such art, killing care and grief of heart, fall asleep or hearing die. Oh, Graham Ben Johnson. Right. Who said that? <laughs> but who said it originally? Oh, Ben Johnson? He said it for himself. Right on. He did? Yeah. Ah. Orare, Ben Johnson. Oh, you're the scholar here then. <laughs> he visited Saint, Saint, we visited Westminster Abbey or Saint, Saint Paul's or Westminster Abbey? <laughs> It's a very uh, f famous, classic sort of approach to a poem that, that I guess Milton picked up on later from uh, uh, the playwright. These are songs from plays by Beaumont, John Fletcher and Francis Beaumont. Uh, uh, there's a, a play listed here as Nice Valor. that has the first line, Hence, all ye vain delights, which you can just tell what's coming up in there. And then I guess uh, uh, Milton uh, it, it took some of that rhetoric. To hence all ye vain. You want to hear what comes after that? It's just that one line. I really like it. <laughs> hence all ye vain delights, as short as are the nights wherein you spend your folly. There is not in this life sweet, if men were wise to see it, but only melancholy. Ah, <laughs> oh, sweetest melancholy. <laughs> Welcome, folded arms and fixed eyes. A sigh that piercing mortifies, a look that's fastened to the ground, a tongue chained up without a sound. Fountain heads and pathless groves, places which pale passion loves. Moonlight walks when all the fowls are warmly housed, save bats and owls, a midnight bell, a parting groan. These are the sounds we feed upon. Then stretch our bones in a still gloomy valley. Nothing so dainty sweet as lovely melancholy. <laughs> That's pretty good, actually. It's a very varied uh, verse form. It's not just simple quatrains. And the last lines are almost like uh, at the end of the sonnet. Next. Ford. What I'm doing is, uh, I think I said, I'm running through the specific poems that most influenced my ear when I was 13 to 25. John Ford, another playwright, 1586-1640. Can you paint a thought or number every fancy in a slumber? Can you count soft minutes roving from a dial's point by moving? Can you grasp a sigh? Or lastly, rob, and, rob a virgin's honor chastely? <laughs> no, oh no, yet you may sooner do both that and this, this and that, and never miss, than by any praise display beauty's beauty, such a glory as beyond all fate, all story, all armies, all arts, all loves, all hearts, Greater than those or they do, shall, and must obey. That's a really great little fast rise into ecstasy and then. 
and a very intelligent. Like, can you, like, in terms of uh, psychology, in terms of uh, uh, self observation, can you paint a thought or number every fancy in a slumber? Can you paint a thought or number every fancy in a slumber? Can you paint a thought or number every fancy in a slumber? Can you count soft minutes roving from a dial's point by moving? Can you grasp a sigh? Or lastly, rob a virgin's honor chastely? No, oh no, no comma, oh no semicolon. Yet you may sooner do both that and this, this and that, and never miss. <laughs> sooner do both that and this, this and that, and never miss. It's like really, you could sing that weirdly. It was, it must have been sung weirdly. Sooner do both that and this, this and that, and never miss. Then by any praise display beauty's beauty, such a glory as beyond all fate, all story, all arms, all arts, all loves, all hearts, greater than those, or they do, shall, and must obey. That is to say, the greater than those is a, uh, all fate, story, all arms, all arts, all loves, all hearts, anything even greater than those, arts, hearts, loves, fates, must do, shall, and must obey beauty's beauty. Be, so, the, so the hero is beauty here. Huh? That's, uh, can you paint a thought? Is the title given here by Auden, I think. Uh, from a play, The Broken Heart. <coughs> <coughs> Uh, there is a, what time is it? 7.30. Oh, good. We got a little, little time. We got all John Donne to go through. So I'm going to save him for next time. And get on to a fellow named James Shirley. Um, uh, and I'm going to read... Um, a poem by James Shirley and a poem by myself. Because mm. well, I was saying that these are things that uh, I heard or uh, got in my ear when I was... Uh, <clears throat> it's called Dirge. Now, Shirley's 1596 to 1666, so now we're getting about a half century later than Shakespeare. Uh, so that, that little airy thing in Shakespeare is, little, is getting, beginning to get a little bit lost, but uh, a kind of funny uh, Buddhist uh, noble uh, truth uh, logic horror is coming in. A death's head is coming in. It's, a, it's a, perhaps a, stupidly, in a sense, like a Western mechanist, mechanistic, industrial-minded uh, wheel has been invented or something. And uh, Blake is about to be born pretty soon. Well, maybe another century. Uh, it's this kind of thing that drove Blake mad, really. But that's actually it's the ape, it's the apex of logical English horror thought. Uh, it comes out of Shakespeare because it, it's, 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 it's like the Shakespeare lines: uh, "All lovers young, all lovers must consign to thee and come to dust. Golden lads and girls all must consign to thee and come to dust." <clears throat> Dirge, from the contention of Ajax and Ulysses. The glories of our blood and state are shadows, not substantial things. There is no armor against fate. Death lays his icy hand on kings. Scepter and crown must tumble down, and in the dust the equal made with the poor crooked scythe and spade. Some men with swords may reap the field and plant fresh laurels where they kill. No. Some men with swords may reap the field and plant fresh laurels where they kill. But their strong nerves at last must yield. They tame but one another still. Early or late, they stoop to fate and must give up their murmuring breath when they Pale captives creep to death. The garlands wither on your brow. Then boast no more your mighty deeds. Upon death's purple altar now, see where the victor victim bleeds. 
your heads must come to the cool tomb. Only the actions of the just smell sweet and blossom in the dust. Now that's even that's better than I thought. Actually, that's really good. Uh, uh, Marion Moore uh, paraphrases that in, uh, uh, in her uh, in one of her poems about the war. I was influenced by this and uh, this mainly. This is called Stanzas Written at Night in Radio City, 1949. If money made the mind more sane, or money mellowed in the bowel the hunger beyond hunger's pain, or money choked the mortal growl and made the groaner grin again, or did the laughing lamb embolden to loll where has the lion lain, I'd go make money and be golden. <laughs> Nor sex will salve the sickened soul, which has its holy goal an hour, holds the heart the golden pole, but cannot save the silver shower, nor heal the sorry parts to hoe. Love is creeping under cover where it hides its sleepy dole, else I were like any lover. Many souls get lost at sea, others slave upon a stone. Engines are not eyes to me, inside buildings icy bone. Some from city to city flee. Famous labors make them lie. I cheat on that machinery. Down in Arden I will die. Art is short, nor style is sure. Though words our virgin thoughts betray, time ravishes that thought most pure which those who know know anyway. For if our daughter should endure when once we can no more complain, men take our beauty for a whore and like a whore to entertain. The city's hipper slickers shine up in the attic with a bat. The higher Chinamen supine wear a dragon in their hats. He who seeks a secret sign in a daze or sicker doze blows the flower superfine. Not a poppy is a rose. If fame were not a fickle charm, there were far more famous men May boys amaze the world to arm, yet their charms are changed again, and fearful heroes turn to harm. But the shambles is a sham. A few angels on a farm fare more fancy with their lamb. No more of this too pretty talk, dead glimpses of apocalypse. The child pissing off the rock, or woman withered in the lips, contemplate the unseen cock that crows all beasts to ecstasy. And so the saints beyond the clock cry to men their dead eyes see. Come, incomparable crown, love, my love is lost to claim. Oh, hollow fame that makes me groan. We are a king without a name. Regain thine angel's lost renown as in the mind's forgotten meadow where brightest shades are cast in stone, man runs after his own shadow. Actually, the first one, two, three, four, five, six lines were after Shirley's scepter and crown was tumbled down. And then I got mixed up and started writing like Yeats. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, child, the woman withered in the lips, so I got to be Crazy Jane or something, contemplate the unseen cock that crows all beast to ecstasy. But that was a takeoff on, um, I know although when looks meet, I, you know, Crazy Jane, Yeats, a figure, like sort of a, a uh, dharma, a, a crazy wisdom figure in Yates. I know although when looks meet, it's on Wild Jack, her lover. I know although when looks meet, I tremble to the bones. The more I leave the door unlatched, the sooner love is gone. For love is but a skein unwound between the dark and the dawn. A lonely ghost, the ghost is that to God shall come. I, love skein upon the ground, my body in the tomb will leap into the light lost in my mother's womb. But were I left to lie alone in an empty bed, the skein so bound us, ghost to ghost, that his walking on the road that night, mine would rise, being dead. So I think I was getting uh, some of that like, dirty old uh, woman talk out of crazy game. 
So, that was James Shirley. But really, it's so good that uh, upon death's purple altar, see where the victor victim bleeds. It's like perfect uh, Dharma karma talk. Uh, and it, it's. Um, uh, I guess that's really. With, uh, I guess this with uh, that poem, Brightness Falls from the Air. Uh, of uh, Nash and of uh, his bones are coral made uh, there's uh, some funny uh, uh, perfect thing death lays his icy hands on kings scepter and crown must tumble down it's hard to get any uh, well I mean it's really so uh, pearl like it's so beautiful uh, you should know those poems. I mean, we should have, have, keep track of just a few really uh, exquisite lines with the exquisite time and exquisite uh, literal detail that they present. So that's surely, if you've got it written down, look it up and read it a couple times. If you read it a couple times, you uh, you don't you, you'll have it in your head uh, without even attempting to memorize it. That's what I find, and I, a lot of, I find with a lot of people. If you have something really good and perfect like that, uh, where it to- makes total sense, and where it's totally literal and the music is perfect, you read it three or four times and fragments hang around in your consciousness, and you'll have them for the rest of your life to refer to. And then you have to fight him when you want to write your own poetry. <laughs> I mean, yeah, because the, the, uh, the, like the nervous system practically gets altered, the entire nervous system, neural network gets altered by these vibrations. It's like really subtle present vibrations, which was a um, theory of the French 20th century poet Antonin Artaud, who, speaking of music and vo- voices and poems, said that there are some uh, tones and vibrations are so uh, uh, penetrant that they actually alter the molecular composition of the nerves. There the, are the certain vibration enters in and alters the, uh, the the physical biochemical structure of the corpse, making a permanent change. What time? Yeah. Okay. I'll continue. I'll continue with a few more of these. I'll continue next week uh, or, or next with uh, George Herbert von Marvel Tahern and do a little done.